The sight and sound of bats in the wee hours of the morning is jarring for people in towns and suburbs across Australia. But for a team of Griffith University researchers in Brisbane, this is what they get up for, gathering bat droppings in the name of science. Led by Dr Alison Peel, they're trying to unlock the secrets of why bats can carry deadly viruses, like Hendra, with immunity, and how to prevent them from being transmitted to people and animals. This roost in Botanic Gardens on Brisbane's Bayside is an ideal collection point. So we're using these uh, plastic sheets to um, try and capture any urine or faecal droppings that come from the bats that are roosting uh, right above us. There's a few bats in the tree at the moment, but this is a nice big tree. So I think when the bats come back in the morning, um, there'll be a lot more bats in here. And so we place these underneath to uh, collect nice clean samples of um, yeah, that urine and faeces. It's dark, but even without head torches, the noise of the bats tells them they're in the right place. So yeah, up here in the tree at the moment, there's probably some young bats there. The pups, as we call the young, uh, at the moment, they'd be still uh, suckling uh, on their mums, but they'll soon start their weaning period, you know, uh, in preparation for the females to mate again for the next season. How often do they mate? Well, they, there's a, a period of time over which mating occurs, and that happens once a year. So the females are pretty remarkable. They're generally either you know, through that sort of month or so long mating period, then they're pregnant for about six months and then they lactate for the rest of the year until it's time to start mating again. Generally, there are no welcome mats for screeching, smelly bats. There's no end of clashes between them and people as communities resort to desperate measures to move them on. Dispersal methods are varied. But for these researchers, bats are their passion. All right, sounds good. Cynthia Pietro Minarco, who's been with the project since 2019, is leading today's fieldwork. We collect two tubes of urine, one in different mediums. So we'll put one in VTM, which stands for viral transport medium. It's basically just a viral storage buffer. The other one is DNA RNA shield, which acts as a preservative, but it also inactivates viruses. The scientists are hoping to detect signs of Hendra virus, a zoonotic disease spread from large flying foxes or bats to horses and people, often with deadly consequences. It was discovered after an outbreak of illness at a large racing stable in the Brisbane suburb of Hendra in 1994. Dr Peter Reid was one of the vets there when it was first identified. I was unknown to science before then, and um, unfortunately we lost 13 horses, died or, or had to euthanise in terrible circumstances, and um, seven horses recovered and were subsequently put down, and uh, unfortunately Vic Rail, the trainer, succumbed to the virus and died about a week after he uh, was first exposed. and. Um, and one of the stable hands became infected. Since then, there have been 66 outbreaks across the east coast of Australia, extending from Port Douglas near Cairns right down to as far as Newcastle. So is it, is it very common that when you are doing these collection samples that there will be a virus in, in the urine? Uh, it will depend on the time of the year. Um, so particularly um, in this part of Australia, Hendra virus tends to be um, more prevalent in, in the winter months. And so we might see at its peak up to sort of 20 or 25 per cent of our samples that we collect at that time will have Hendra virus in them. At other times of the year, there are none. So obviously when we're sampling here, we can't tell what's going to be the case. And so we assume that every sample that we're working with uh, potentially has Hendra virus in it. Dr Alison Peel and her team are focusing on the way viruses, like the Hendra virus, circulate within the bat population. So we know that uh, these flying foxes have lived with Hendra virus for a very long time. They don't get sick from the infection, and so the virus just passes through the population, fluctuates up and down. And so we try to understand the dynamics of the virus within the population to better understand what causes it to increase or decrease at certain times and, and how that associates with risk of um, spillover to horses. About 80% of horses that contract Hendra die or have to be euthanised. In those 66 outbreaks, we've had um, 
42 of those in Queensland and 24 of those in New South Wales. Unfortunately, we've lost 108 horses and during that time, four people have died, unfortunately, and three people have been ex- heavily exposed and recovered. And also during that time, we've had something like 16 horse owners that have been heavily exposed to Hendra virus. A vaccination for the virus has been available for horses right. since November 2012. Dr Reid says it's affordable and readily available. Vaccinating horses not only prevents them getting infected um, and developing disease, but it prevents them shedding virus through their nose or oral secretions and contaminating and infecting people. And uh, that's the most effective way to uh, prevent the disease. We know the vaccine's highly effective and safe. It's been proven. The Hendra virus is only found in Queensland and New South Wales. But because of the unique properties of the virus, the way it transmits from bats to horses and then from horses to humans and doesn't create a pandemic is what makes it fascinating for a global study. In 2013, wildlife ecologist Dr Peggy Eby joined an international transdisciplinary study of Hendra virus. And my contribution was the ecological and environmental factors that played into that. I was able to bring to it long-term data sets, data sets that we started collecting in 1998 and had collected in a standard way every year since. And putting that information together with the wonderful expertise of the other people in the team, we were able to develop hypotheses about what was causing endovirus spillover and to test them using the environmental data that we had. The result is an understanding of when and why a spillover, or the virus spreads from bats to horses, may occur. What we found is that um, endovirus risk is elevated in the winter following a period of food shortage for flying foxes. We've also found, though, that a rich pulse of flowering, winter flowering, in native forests completely mitigates that risk. Can you predict when Hendra virus is going to happen then, if, if you've noticed a pattern? Yes, we can predict it. We've come to understand that drought conditions, which are indicated by uh, strong El Ninos, lead to a period of food shortage in the following winter spring. Yep. See if we can see those animals. Yep. Both Dr Eby and Dr Peel say the best way to combat the loss of food for bats, which is key to reducing a likely outbreak of Hendra virus, is to protect their habitats. So there's a young here who's hanging completely independently and the only thing that way it's touching the female is through the nipple. What we've discovered is that rich pulses of winter flowering completely reduced and we think are protective of Hendra virus transmission. And there are a number of reasons why that might be the case. What we don't know clearly is why that has changed. We've looked at southeast Queensland where some extensive forests that had reliably flowering winter food have been progressively cleared for development of Brisbane, Ipswich, the Gold Coast, and for agricultural intensification. The species of tree lost for the bat colonies in southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales also happen to be important for koalas in the same areas. Unsurprisingly, koalas attract more funding than bats. Currently, a considerable amount is being spent on replanting and re-establishing this vegetation for koala habitats, something Dr Eby refers to as a happy coincidence. And so we are hopeful that we will be able to work with governments at different levels, local government, state government, federal government, to increase that amount of planting to ensure that it happens in locations that will be beneficial to flying foxes and might lead to a reduction of spillover risk. Tweed council workers have been replanting this area in northern New South Wales since 2018. And in, within two years, the koalas were seen in some of the trees. We're, we might even see one today, if you're lucky. I hope so. <laughs> as much as we searched, we didn't see any koalas or bats, but there were signs everywhere. 
So this is a swamp mahogany. Um, so this is one of the primary food trees for koalas in, in our area. Um, and it's also one of those key winter flowering flying fox food tree species. And it's heaving with both koala and flight. No, there's none here. <laughs> <laughs> none here, but I can see koala scats on the ground. Um, from here. Um, this tree is obviously heavily used. You're not, not going to do used. it? Oh, Har could, Harry Butler and... <laughs> Look, here's one now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's plenty of them. That's the really funding cool. model for this particular yeah, project um, starts so with Tweed yeah, Council, well, scouts, but it also has ground state ground government ground involvement. You know, people love koalas, bats not so much. So is there an understanding that this work is also going to help bats and is that okay? That's okay. I mean, yeah, there's, there's an understanding, I think, underlying all of our habitat restoration work that, yes, the funding might come specifically for koalas, but we know that we're restoring ecosystems, or at least we're trying our very best to. Dr Eby says her research benefits from the work of others working in the same field. She empathises with those who dislike bats or flying foxes. It's noisy, it's smelly, it's uncomfortable. I absolutely acknowledge that and am sympathetic to it. But we have not found a way to be able to manage that yet. People have used dispersals. They essentially don't work. If the animal does, if the animals do leave that initial roost, they set up another, typically within a kilometre of that one, which means they're still in an urban area and they're just affecting different neighbours, but it's not resolving the problem. So this is a wildlife management issue that we need to get a better hold on and we need to be able to resolve to help people.